for joining us for our corn and soybean update. I'm Jim Minter, director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture. And joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who's a professor of ag economics and also the associate director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. We're going to review some new information from USDA, which was released last week. The World Ag Supply Demand Estimate report came out. And of course, that follows on the heels of the planning intentions report that came out roughly a week earlier. And there's been a lot of new information, a lot of it impacting both the corn and soybean markets. And uh, we're going to delve right into it, Michael. So if you look at last week's WASDE, uh, the changes on the U.S. side with respect to the corn balance sheet were actually pretty small. They did reduce estimated feed usage about 25 million bushels. Uh, they raised the ethanol usage forecast about 25 million bushels to 5.375 billion bushels. We'll talk more about that later. Um, there was no change in the corn export forecast, so that one held steady at 2.5 billion bushels. And then no change in U.S. corn ending stocks carried over into the upcoming marketing year. That's still holding at 1.44 billion bushels. Um, the USDA did make some changes, however, in the world corn trade matrix. And of course, that's of tremendous interest given what's going on not only in South America, which is always an issue this time of year, but especially with respect to what's going on in Ukraine with the war and the potential impact on corn exports from Ukraine and to a lesser extent Russia. So uh, USDA did raise its estimate of Brazil's corn exports uh, to 44.5 million metric tons. That's up from 43 million metric tons. That's about a 3.5% increase and really rides on the fact that uh, USDA is forecasting a, a modest increase in USDA's uh, uh, corn, uh, corn production forecast for Brazil. Um, the one that I think everybody was looking for to see what would happen here was Ukraine's corn exports. Um, they did reduce UX, U, Ukraine's corn export forecast to about 23 million metric tons. That's down from 27.5 million metric tons. That's a 21% decrease. And I have to say, Michael, um, I know it's more than a guess, but it's certainly at this point, it's very speculative in, in terms of how Ukraine's corn exports are going to turn out for the 21 marketing year and then going forward to the 22 marketing year as well. Yeah, the key phrase that you talked about was forecast. These are forecasts or estimates, and they, and they could be adjusted uh, as we move, for, move forward. Yeah, and, and a lot of this is tied to trying to get a handle on how many, uh, how many bushels of corn uh, were already exported from Ukraine prior to the beginning of the war in late February. Um, the data coming out of there isn't nearly as good as what we have in the U.S., but it's always a challenge with respect to uh, knowing just where you're at in the export channel. Um, so my guess is that that's going to be probably high. Uh, if I had to guess right now, my expectation would be U Ukraine's corn exports might actually wind up for the 21 marketing year being a little smaller than that 23 metric ton, million metric tons that USDA is currently forecasting. Um, the big news on the planning intentions report, of course, was the surprisingly small corn planting estimate for 2022. USDA's estimate came in at 89.5 million acres. And I want to point out to the viewers that this is based on a survey. So the, the stated date of the survey is March 1. The actual survey uh, responses are gathered a little bit around the date of March 1 but a nominal date of, of beginning March. And, you know, there could be some change there, Michael, but, uh, you know, that's a 4 million acre decline, roughly. Um, a lot of speculation as to whether or not we might see some switching from soybeans back into corn based in part on the, some of the profitability estimates. What do you think? I think a half million to a million increase would be a large increase. And so I, I, don't, think, I don't think we're looking at a two, three million uh, acre shift. Uh, between now and planting, you know, because we're already planting in some areas of the country, and so and so, I think that's important to keep in mind. Even, even if even though corn does appear to be quite profitable compared to soybeans, uh, there's some challenges associated with increasing corn acres this time of year. First of all, uh, you know, have you planned to plant corn? Uh, in the spring, and you know, I, I have, you know, uh, uh, anhydrous ammonia went up again uh, this last week, and and, and can, can you find uh, sufficient supplies of, of nitrogen to plant corn? And so there's just, there's just a lot of what ifs you have to go through uh, if you're going to switch from soybeans to corn. Yeah, if you look at the uh, actual uh, planting intentions released by USDA versus the trades expectations, uh, this chart really kind of illustrates that. So you look at the various estimates that were out there, and there were people forecasting uh, planted corn acreage of in the ballpark of 93 to 93 and a half million acres. The kind of the average estimate was probably about 91.5. Uh, 
Um, USDA came in below just about everybody's forecast, so that was a surprise. Uh, and of course, that's what produced the response in the futures market as soon as those, those numbers were released. It's interesting to look at the state-by-state -state data, Michael, and this map kind of helps illustrate that a little bit. Uh, the red states, obviously, are the states where we're looking for uh, smaller uh, corn acreage in 2022 versus 2021. Uh, some blue states with some increases. Uh, as you look at the map, what do you, what's your take? There's several interesting, interesting things when you look at the map. First of all, there's about a million acres just represented by the I states uh, in terms of the switch uh, from, from uh, uh, corn to soybeans. There's also a rather large reductions in, in North Dakota and Minnesota. That also is a lot of, it, lot of the acreage that's switching. But one of the things we were talking about earlier this morning uh, was, in the, was the, down the south. Uh, where there's huge declines, even though the acreage is not as big down there, but huge declines in, in expected corn acreage down in the south. And as we were indicating, it's still wet down there in a large swath of the south, and so that's probably not going to switch. And so when you, th you think about where the corn acres might, might switch, or, um, and to increase that 89.5, I would focus on Minnesota and the three I states, uh, perhaps increasing corn acres a little bit. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. And, of course, the one thing that might hold back Minnesota is the cold weather. Yes. Uh, snow moving through that part of the country this Same week. Same with North Dakota. Yeah, that's kind of delaying things up there. So I, I tend to agree with you. If we're going to see some switching, it's probably going to be in the I states and maybe towards the western Corn Belt. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I, de I definitely think Nebraska and or Kansas. We could see some more corn in, in those two states. So, but the bottom line is, at this late stage, if you look at history... Um, the years when we have had a significant deviation in acreage from the planning intentions to, for example, the June report, we tend to be weather-based years. Yes. We don't have a lot of evidence that suggests people change their minds based on the economics this late in the game. Weather kind of forces people's hands some years, but if that's not the case, we tend not to see very much switching. And that would be an argument for really not seeing much additional corn acreage at all, in addition to what you said yeah. about inputs. Yeah, as I go back, even a half million would be a large switch, a large change. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. And I guess as kind of a backstop for that in our Ag Economy Barometer surveys, you know, we continue to pick up between 25 and 30 percent of the people in the survey say they've had some difficulty obtaining crop inputs for the 2022 crop. And I, I do think that's going to be a significant factor in terms of inhibiting switching from, in particular, soybeans to corn. Yes. So if you take USDA's planning intentions number uh, at face value and then assume a trend yield for the 2022 crop, you wind up with a corn production estimate of about 14.8 billion bushels. Different people are going to have slightly different numbers on that depending on how they estimate their trend yield, but close to 15 billion bushels. So if you think about it from a longer term perspective, that would be the third largest corn crop on record. So still a very large corn crop by historical standards, even with the smaller than expected acreage, Michael. Um, as you think about ending stocks, USDA's current projection for the 21 marketing year going into the 22 marketing year is just a little less than 10%, 9.6%. And then if you take consumption levels or usage levels at 21 levels and just project those into 22 uh, and using the production number that I just had up there, that 14.8 billion bushels, you'd wind up with a projected carryover coming out of the 22 crop going into the 23 crop year of about 9%. But boy, those ending stocks estimates are very, very tenuous at this stage, obviously vulnerable to what happens with respect to yield this summer, um, but also uncertainty about exports and ethanol usage, right? Yeah, it's both demand and supply, and, and, and I want to I emphasize yield. This is assuming a trend yield, and we're looking at 9%. If we have something under trend yield, you're looking at some very tight corn stocks and probably a very volatile market. Yeah, if you'd reduce uh, the corn yield by roughly five bushels per acre, which wouldn't be too difficult to do with some adverse weather, uh, either at the front end or maybe more likely during the growing season, you really potentially tighten up the corn stocks carryover uh, pretty dramatically and, and put it down in the ballpark of where it was in 2012 or even tighter than that. And trend yield's a pretty, a pretty optimistic assumption this summer because we know people are probably going to use at least a little bit less nitrogen, not on every farm, but some farms are probably going to reduce their nitrogen rate a little bit simply because uh, nitrogen's so expensive. And, and so, uh, and so, that, and so uh, having a trend yield this year 
uh, you know, given that, given, given the, the, the dryness in, in several parts of the country, it's, it's probably optimistic at this point. Yeah, so uh, let's take a look at what's going on with ethanol because I think that's one of the key usage categories. Um, ethanol production so far in this crop year, so going back to early September through last week, is up about 11% compared to a year earlier. If you look at USDA's corn usage estimate on the balance sheet, it's only up about 7% compared to the prior year. And that's why a lot of people, myself included, think that maybe USDA is being a little too conservative with respect to their ethanol usage number. That would tighten up the current year's corn ending stocks a little bit. Um, and then as you think about what's going on with exports, that's when the whole Ukraine situation really starts to come into play. Um, so this chart looks at major exporters, corn ending stocks. So the major corn exporters are U.S., uh, Brazil, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, and South Africa. So when you aggregate across those and look at those major, exportings, major exporters, corn ending stocks, USDA's current projection for those five countries in the aggregate is about 4.4% excuse me, 4 .4 of usage. That's up compared to 3.6% last year. But you have to question the accuracy of that or whether or not that's really going to turn out to be the case because uh, Ukraine alone accounts for about 12% of the estimated world corn, ending, world corn ending stocks. And you have to question how much of that's really going to be available to the market. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing as much volatility as we are in the marketplace is the difficulty in getting a handle on how much of that corn coming out of Ukraine really is available to the marketplace. Uh, if you start pulling back on that, all of a sudden that major corn exporter ending stock number looks a lot tighter than it does on the chart. Yeah, and, you, and you've got three years in a row of pretty tight supplies there. 20, 20 was tight, 3.6%. 21, your estimate's 4.4%. 22 is also likely to look very tight. And so, uh, and so that's, that's, a, that's a perfect scenario for volatility. Yeah, to put it in perspective, back in 2011, 2012, those major corn exporter ending stocks were in the 37 to 3.8% range. We could easily get down to that or even, even, even tighter than that, uh, depending on how you want to account for the Ukraine estimates. Um, Nathan Thompson wasn't able to join us today, but he did provide us some good background information that he normally provides on these programs, and that is looking at some storage opportunities for corn. So he's done the usual where he looks at cash bids going out, in this case, to August. Uh, the current bid plus on-farm storage costs, which he estimates at a penny per bushel per month, plus an opportunity cost charge of about 6% on an APR basis. And then he looks at a commercial a current bid plus commercial storage cost, which he estimates at four cents per bushel per month, and then using that same opportunity cost. You know, and I think the key point is, Michael, if you look at current bids of about 753 and here in central Indiana, as you start thinking about hanging onto that corn into late summer, for example, um, you're looking at some break-even prices that would equilibrate with that 753 of about, depending on whether you're looking at on-farm or off-farm storage, 772, 784. So you're hanging on for some pretty high prices. What's your take? I'm a downside risk person, and uh, you know, you, you are, it is possible uh, to get to that 770, 775. We painted a picture. You have some, you have some uh, incremental weather in the U.S. and and uh, and Ukraine uh, can't produce as much as we think they're going to be able to produce. Uh, you can you can you can paint a scenario where corn prices are going to be relatively high. However, uh, you could also paint a scenario where Ukraine gets more more planted than we than than we thought they could. Uh, Brazil's crop looks better uh, than we think it's going to be. We have really good weather in the U.S. Uh, and 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 that price goes down. And so and so my point here is once you get into about June. Middle of June into July, uh, the volatility really increases uh, when, you're, when you're hanging on to old crop. And of course, we've talked about this on previous programs, volatility of basis really increases once you get past roughly the first of June or certainly the middle of June. Uh, so recognize if you choose to hang on to those summer months, you're doing so with a portion of your crop that perhaps you can afford to take some higher level of risk on. Um, you know, as you think about the numbers, Michael, and you were kind of illustrating maybe the downside, I guess I probably favor more of the upside. Yeah. But, but one of the challenges right now is it's difficult to ascertain how much of tightening in supplies relative to the factors you just discussed is already built into current futures prices, right? Yeah. That's, that's always the difficulty this time of year. I have to remind our viewers on a seasonal basis, Seasonally, you'd expect to see corn prices top out here, perhaps in late May, early June time frame. So we're getting close to that normal seasonal peak. And if you've got some corn in inventory, 
it's probably a time of year when you really want to pay close attention and look for some opportunities on some up days, for example. Um, Nathan took a look at uh, corn basis, looking at the crop basis tool on the Center for Commercial Agriculture's website. You know, this one happens, this chart is for uh, central Indiana for corn. He's comparing the black line is the current year's basis on a weekly, uh, these are all Wednesday quotes, uh, compared to the three-year average. And you see that bump up that took place shortly after the invasion of Ukraine when we saw some switching of export uh, destinations coming out of the Black Sea region to the U.S. And that really bumped up the basis um, in a number of locations. Now we're seeing basis running a little bit below the three-year average. But if you look at the last couple of weeks, it looks like we're kind of getting back to the three-year average and that being a pretty good forecast as you look out uh, into May and in, into early June. Um, Nathan also took a look at Corn River basis. So this is uh, off of the Southern Indiana and Southern Illinois River terminal, terminals on the Ohio River. And again, you can see that bump up in basis that took place when we saw that boost in the export channels, uh, demand to fill barges to get down into New Orleans and, and fill some exports that normally would have probably originated from the Black Sea region. And then once that got past we saw a weakening in basis, and then here the last couple of weeks, we've seen basis come back up and starting to head towards uh, the multi-year average there, the three-year average. So, um, you know, if you're trying to do some basis projections here for the next month or two, I think we're back to looking at using the three-year average uh, for, for a pretty reasonable forecast going forward. As you look at the ethanol plant basis, that's always an interesting one. And you know Nathan's got several different lines on this chart because it's hard to look at it on an average basis. In other words, I guess another way of thinking about it is, have we had an average year re recently, <laughs> right? So that's, that's one of the challenges, especially with respect to ethanol. He does have a 2015 to 2017 average line on there. The green line is 2018 to 2019 crop year. The red line's 2019 to 2020, and then the purple line is 2020 to 21. And of course, in those last two, you can see the bump up that took place, uh, largely attributable to the shortfall in, in corn acreage that took place in the 19 crop and that spilled over into the 2020 crop marketing year. Um, if you look at this year's, and I'll go ahead and add that in, the black line is what's taken place so far this year. And as you look at it, you know, basis at the ethanol plants really weakened sharply at the same time that basis at the river terminals was really starting to peak there, at least pretty close. Uh, and now we've seen basis at the ethanol plants start to recover and, and start approaching that three-year average again, that 2015 to 2017 average. And so if you had to think about, you know, what you might expect to see with respect to basis at the ethanol plants here the next few weeks, next couple of months, I, I think that the three-year average, that 2015 to 2017 average is probably our best estimate going forward. Uh, this is an interesting table, and it, it, I, Nathan and I have talked about this a good bit. It's interesting to go back and look at what the opportunities were on the day of the webinar going back to January. So the prices he's got listed there on January, the day that we uh, broadcast the January webinar, then the February webinar, the March webinar, and now here the April webinar. And it just kind of drives home what's taking place in the cash market here and, and the futures market, right? So and back in January... Uh, July corn futures were at 588. In Feb, they were at 640. March, 718. This morning, when Nathan was putting this chart together, 773. So then you look at the corresponding cash estimates, right? You're looking at potentially locking in an expected May cash price of a little below $6 back in January. And now, you know, you've got an opportunity to market corn at about 775. Yeah, this is a really interesting table. And of course, the May 22 delivery, that's the 21 crop. And that 21 is going to be pretty profitable. Under even the even in January price, a, a 590 was a good price uh, when you look at the break even for the 21 crop. Going to the 22 crop uh, in January, we, we we were about at break even for folks at 539. I mean, in fact, uh, there's producers what would have a 22 break even below that if you plugged in trend yields, but there's producers with a break even above that because of our large increase in, in, in production costs this year. But we went from essentially a break even in January. Uh, to perhaps having a, uh, an economic profit of a dollar fifty in April, just a tremendously large uh, increase in, in profitability potential from January to April. And so you've got to wonder, Jim, and I, this is kind of an open question for you, whether that 707 
uh, price is attractive from a, a forward contracting or uh, are you selling some of your crop? When you look at that 22 crop. That's an easy question, Michael. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think if you have an opportunity to lock in $7 or better at, at, for fall delivery, uh, most of our viewers probably have to make some sales right off the combine. That's a pretty attractive price. And if you haven't really started any marketing, certainly a great place to start. I have seen some estimates out there that suggest producers have already priced an unusually large amount of their crop. I'm not sure that's really the case. I don't see a lot of evidence of that, but I have seen some speculation on some of the newsletters talking about that. Um, so it kind of depends on where you're at in your marketing plan for the year, but particularly for people that either haven't made any sales or have made very small sales so far for the 22 crop, that $7 uh, plateau sure looks very attractive. And we'll talk more about your break-evens yeah. coming out of uh, your budgets here in a, in a few minutes, Michael. But uh, that's going to look pretty good compared yes. to your break-evens on, on the budget, good. right? So, And I guess I'll pause here and just point out, this is from a profitability standpoint, one reason you might think about switching some acres yes. from soybeans to corn. This does look yes. very profitable. It's changed for soybeans, but not near this much. Good point. All right, let's talk about the key changes to the soybean balance sheet in this month's report. They did increase the export forecast by a small amount, uh, 25 million bushel increase. Really no change in the U.S. corn ending stocks, that says corn, should be soybeans ending stocks estimate at 1.44 billion bushels. I've got a glitch there. Let's see, that's not the right number. I forgot to estimate there. I've got an extra line in there is what happened. The ending stocks estimate declined 25 million bushels to 260 million bushels. I need to delete that second line on the slide, sorry. Um, they also made some changes in the world soybean trade matrix, um, and that's really probably what people were looking at as much as anything. So on the Brazil side, they did uh, change the expected exports by 2.7 million, 2.75 million metric tons. That's about a 3.2% reduction in the expected exports coming out of Brazil. They pulled back Brazil's expected production, 2 million metric tons. So they pulled back the exports a little bit more than they pulled back production estimate down there. Uh, so they're at 125 million metric tons compared to 127 uh, last month. <coughs> and if you look at some of the private estimates, some of the private estimates are still below where USDA is at. So it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out here over the next, maybe the next, probably the next WASDE report. Um, they did pull back Paraguay a little bit. Of course, Paraguay is a small player. Uh, they pulled that back to 2.9 million metric tons from 3.6. So uh, the other big change and one that people were looking for, I think, was they did reduce China's expected imports of soybeans to 91 million metric tons. That was down from 94 million metric tons on the March report. So a 3 million metric ton reduction in expected imports into China, and that's, that's a big deal. Um, so if you think about what's going on here, uh, not a huge change to the soybean balance sheet. Uh, but some interesting ones and maybe some ones that aren't quite finished, particularly with respect to what's going on in South America. Of course, the big surprise in soybeans was the soybean planted acreage estimate coming out of the planting intentions report. 91 million acres versus 87.2 million acres last year. So basically flipping about 4 million acres of corn into soybeans. And that was a bigger shift than just anybody expected. Again, if you look at uh, industry expectations, the survey of the uh, analysts that were out there in terms of uh, providing an estimate or a guesstimate of what the planted acreage might be. I think the high end coming in the report was 90 million acres. The mean or midpoint of the, of the analyst estimates was probably about 88.5 million acres. So we picked up two to two and a half million acres relative to what the trade thought was likely coming into this report. So again, that's why you saw the reaction as soon as the report came out. Um, Again, Michael, looking at the soybean acreage on a state-by-state -state basis, it's pretty much the flip side of what yeah. we saw in corn, right? Yeah, pretty much the flip side. And, and again, if you're going to get a, a, a mil, if you're going to get a half million to a million acres more corn, I think it's going to come out of those I states and, and perhaps Minnesota. Uh, we already talked about uh, the, the weather issues up in Minnesota, but I think that's where it's going to have to come from. North Dakota is kind of interesting here. North Dakota was actually down on both corn and soybeans, and and what. From what I can tell, what's going on in North Dakota, they have a lot of different options. And so durum wheat, sunflowers, canola, some of these crops that, uh, uh, that we don't often talk about on these webinars are expected to increase in North Dakota and displace uh, some of the corn and soybeans in, in that particular state. 
And how much of that do you think is drought driven? I think quite a bit. Uh, you know, if you, you know when, when you have a, a, a big drought uh, like they, they did last year and the profitability is relatively low, you're looking for something different to plant. And, uh, and it I continues was to be dry. I was surprised that there wasn't more spring wheat up there on, on the potential plantings. Maybe that'll change uh, between now, uh, now, now and the dust settles. Dust settles a good a good term because it's, it continues to be dry up there yes. at least in a good bit. Now some parts of North Dakota did pick up some snow this week. I'm not sure how much moisture they were going to get out of the snow. Sometimes those snowfalls are pretty dry. It's drier to the west, and so it's it's less dry where where in the east where where a lot of the corn and soybeans would be located. Yeah, good point. So you know one of the questions I think some people had coming into the planning intentions report was whether or not we could pull some additional acres in. And USDA releases what they call the principal crop acres numbers, which is, I think, the 17 principal crops. So it includes, obviously, the major crops like corn, soybeans, and wheat, but it includes all the minor crops as well. And that principal crop acreage estimate came in almost identical to last year, 317.4 three million acres versus 317.2 last year. There were some years back in that 16, 17, 18 time frame when we had a couple million more acres in the principal crops than what USDA is showing this year. So there's maybe a little bit of an opportunity between now and the 1st of June or the 1st of July to pull in some acres. But uh, if we do, it's going to be pretty small, I think. Yeah, and I think it goes back to, you know, if you're going to have more corn acres, it's probably going to have to pull from soybeans. I think it comes back to that. We're not going to magically see some additional ground go into production in corn and soybeans. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are going to see a topsy-turvy between yeah. those two, or a tug-of-war, really, I guess is a better way to think of it, uh, for going forward here, um, to the extent that people are willing to make some switches. So, you know, how large will the 22 U.S. soybean crop wind up being? Well, if you take USDA's planting intentions at face value, plug in a trend yield, again, there's going to be some variability on trend yield depending on how you choose to estimate your trend, how many years you use. Um, I came up with about 4.56 billion bushels. That'd be the largest soybean crop on record for the U.S. Um, and you know, a significant imp increase, I guess, compared to last year. Last year was a 4.44, um, but a lot of a lot of ifs there, right? Uh, so, is, if you think about ending stocks, uh, which is what people really like to focus on, this year's estimate for the 21 crop is an ending stock estimate of about 5.8 percent, so almost 6 percent. Um, using the production estimate I just gave you, the 4.56 billion bushels, and then carrying forward uh, consumption or usage levels that match the 21 estimates, you wind up with a projected carryover into the 23 crop coming out of the 22 crop of about 9%. So that looks like a, a significant increase in carryover. But boy, there's still some big ifs there, right? Uh, what, num what's truly amazing to me about that 9% number is if you, if you go back to pre-ethanol, let's go back to 2006 on your previous slide, we've seen an increase in soybean production of 50%. 50%, that isn't that long ago. Uh, and, and, but, but, but also the fact that we have 91 million acres of soybeans this year and we're still below 10%, I think that's, just, that's just almost unbelievable. If you stop to think about it. Yeah, it, it, it just shows you how strong the demand really is that's right. for soybeans. And it, really what it speaks to is uh, the impact that growth in consumer incomes around the world has really had on demand for soybeans and, so, and ultimately soybean meal, and now more recently soybean oil. Yeah. Uh, of course, soybean oil is partly because of biofuels. Um, it does bring into question, uh, and the market's been worried about this lately, you know, strength and economic growth uh, in one country yes. in particular, namely China. Yeah. Right? We've seen some concerns rise there related to the lockdowns and what that's doing to the Chinese economy and what that might mean. Uh, USDA did pull back their estimate of soybean imports going into China from a worldwide sources. The question is, did they pull it back enough? Yeah. And that's what people are wondering about here now. And we're going to continue to see these gyrations because, truthfully, these are unprecedented times, right? We have a tremendous amount of uncertainty. We see that every month when we look at yeah. the barometer surveys, yeah. right? Yeah, another amazing thing about this slide here, I remember sitting in the same room with Chris Hurt, and we were looking at that 23% number. And we were talking about how long is it going to take uh, to get something down closer to 10%? Two years. Two yeah. years we were down there. Yeah. Amazing. Good, good point. Uh, so a little bit like we did on the corn side, I looked at the major exporters' soybean ending stocks. And not quite as much uncertainty here as what I illustrated on the corn side. But still, 
um, still some issues there. So if you look at those uh, major exporters, and again, the major exporters are a little simpler on the soybean side. Really, it's the U.S., Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. And of course, Paraguay is a very small player. So the dominant ones are obviously the U.S. and Brazil. As you pointed out, back coming out of that 18 crop, on a worldwide basis, we were at 25% uh, for those major exporters. The last two years, it's been right around 17%. The 21 crop estimate from USDA currently is at about 14%, but that's still dependent on what goes on with the Brazilian crop. We don't really have the Brazil crop size settled yet. I think a lot of people expect to see another pullback on the upcoming uh, WASD report next month. Uh, if that materializes, we could tighten that a little further on a worldwide basis. And if you look at history, you know, 2011 was 14%. If you go below 14 this year, that puts you tighter than we were in the 11, kind of 2012 time frame, right? So it just emphasizes that competition for acreage that we're seeing between corn and soybeans, not only in the U.S., but in the world. Yeah, good, good point. So again, Nathan uh, Thompson shared with us uh, his update with respect to uh, operating, op excuse me, marketing opportunities for soybeans. Um, Current bid, 1652 here in April. If you hang on to June in this case, uh, and on farm storage, you're looking at a break even, I think, of about, uh, I'm trying to have a, little, have a little trouble reading that number, Michael, but it looks like it's probably about 1670 or so. No, 1680, I think. Commercial storage would be 1689. Um, and then the, the bids are pretty much flat line out to, uh, to June at 1653. So, really no incentive on the current, uh, current set of bids out there. Um, if you look at the basis values, uh, we've been bouncing around. We've gotten up to the three-year average, or excuse me, the two-year average, um, and then we back off a little bit. If you look at the recent data, we've been a little bit below the two-year average. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see that strengthen a little bit here as we head into spring. Um, and again, like we said on corn, once you get past roughly the first of June, maybe the middle of June, uh, it becomes difficult to forecast basis. A lot of variability in the estimates and, and later on to the uh, tail end of the spring and, and early summer months. If you look at the soybean river basis like we did on corn, it's been pretty volatile. And again, you can see uh, some variation in, in export demand there with some of the strength we saw early on. Uh, we saw some weakness here a few weeks ago. Lately, we're back above the uh, the three-year, I think on this chart, it's actually a three-year average. So, you know, again, if you want to think about where that basis is headed going out into, for example, June, uh, I think the three-year average is, is probably your, your best opportunity there, and that would put you at a positive basis of between 10 and 20 cents at those river terminals on, on the Ohio River. Once again, looking at the cash prices uh, and futures prices that were available on the days that we did the webinars back in January, February, and March, and now April. So in January, July futures were at 1395. Today, this morning, just uh, I think right about the open, or maybe the overnight trade, I guess, actually 1670. Um, if you look at November futures back in January, they were trading at 13. Uh, this morning they were just below $15. When, when I looked before we came over to do the program, they were kind of flirting with the $15 mark. So uh, if you look at it on a cash basis, adjusted for the basis expectations, back in January, May delivery was looking at $14.10. Here in uh, April, we're looking at $16.85. Uh, when you look at new crop, back in January, we were looking at $12.70. Now we're looking at $14.67. Um, Michael, you and I were talking about this earlier this morning. If you look at what's taken place between March and April and recognize that in the middle there was the planning <laughs> intentions report with that surprisingly large acreage number, it's kind of impressive to note that November futures are actually higher now than they were when we did the yeah. March webinar. I think it goes back to some very unique, uh, unique circumstances that we're facing this year. The competition for acres is certainly a part of that. The uncertainty of the size of the Brazilian crop has got to be playing in there, and, and uh, that's really surprising because you know typically when something like this happens, you see that four million acre shift, for example, soybeans would just crash and stay crashed, you know, stay well below that mark. We number. did see a negative reaction, but boy, but we bounced but back. The fact that it's come back up, yeah, it bounced back. Uh, very, very interesting yes. and, and illustrative, I think, of the uncertainty about supplies and maybe the strength in demand as well. Yeah. And even though, even though I've been saying that that corn uh, looks quite profitable, 
It's not that soybeans are unprofitable. It's just that corn is more profitable than soybeans. Certainly, a 14.67 price uh, for 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 November uh, for November soybeans is, is is very strong and and well above most people's break even. Yeah, good point. So you've taken Speaking a look at the break which, evens, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and so break evens on corn. I mean, you look at average productivity. That'd be 182 bushel corn, uh, 560. Uh, obviously, we're we're substantially above that right now. On uh, high productivity, gets down to about 510, uh, a break-even price. Uh, that's still up substantially from last year, 25% uh, up from last year. Uh, but the real story here is is how this this surge in corn prices we've seen since January is really t a turn to situation. We were about at break-even uh, to something uh, that's very that's very profitable. Uh, 22 is, is it looks like it might turn into one of those years that's uh, one of the most profitable years in the last 15 years. Now, obviously, it could change. Uh, it, could ch it could change a lot uh, between now and harvest, and that's why we're encouraging you uh, to take a look at some of those, uh, those, those cash bids uh, for fall corn and fall soybeans. So, Michael, just to kind of reiterate for, your, for our viewers, so on your high productivity estimate, you're using what for a year? 215 bushel corn. And average was 180. 182, and then the low, uh, the low that would be more southeast Indiana, but there'd be there'd be some low productivity in every uh, every region of, of Indiana, of course. Uh, that's more in the 160. Okay, so that kind of helps set the stage yeah. in terms of knowing where you're at, maybe perhaps. Uh, soybeans are a similar story. They're not quite as profitable as corn, but but certainly when you uh, compare the 1253 for average productivity to that 1467 we were talking about, you're looking at a very profitable situation for soybeans, despite the fact uh, that we had a large increase in cost and we're and we're, and we might plant 91 million acres of soybeans this year. So to help people out with respect to the productivity, yeah, the high productivity would be 65, the average would be 55, and the low would be 45, and so. Uh, we know there's folks out there that have been getting 70, 70 bushels and higher. Uh, you're looking at a break even below 1160. Good point. Assuming your costs are not substantially higher uh, than, than our budgets. Uh, and so just to summarize 22, uh, you, you remember that 22 bar was, was, about, was about down to where that long run average is uh, a few months ago when we were doing these webinars. Now it's getting up to be very, very similar uh, to what, uh, what uh, 21 turned out to be. So this is a case where we probably should have gone and pulled back this chart that you used. I think the first time you presented this chart was probably in October. Yes. And it has changed dramatically since October, right? Yeah. So my, I'll just give you my memory of it. Yeah. So my memory is that when you did this the first time back in the fall, that 21 projection was in the ballpark of where the red line is, which was the average. Is that correct? The 22, yes. The 22 was actually a little below average. When you went to October, November, as we went to December, it got closer uh, to the average. Then as, as we moved into February in particular, uh, when corn prices started to increase uh, rather rapidly, uh, it, it, it got to be substantially over that red, that red line, the red line being the long run average. So I think this is worth just thinking about a little bit, right? This is a dramatic change from really six months, essentially, into your initial projections for 22, which already had the rise, or a good bit of the rise in yes. production costs built into them. Not, not quite all of it, because prices, particularly in fertilizer, continued to yeah. go up. In 20, your initial projection for 22, compared to where you're at today, has changed by over $200 yes. per acre. Probably closer to 250 We don't have a, a track record. Of, <laughs> I can't track that over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. To, but my guess uh, is that might be the biggest swing from October to April ever. I'd have to go back to that 73, 74 period to see how big the swing was uh, when those exports, were, ex exports, exports. started to surge. Uh, but my guess, it, it, unless you went that far back, you wouldn't see anything like this. Yeah, I, that was sort of my yeah. memory bank. I, yeah. But we don't have actually have a database to check that. But... That is an unbelievable change in profitability over that six months time frame when people were starting to make their plans for the 2022 crop yeah. versus what it looks like as planters are all sitting in the yard ready to go, right? That's yeah. kind of where we're at today. And what makes this really interesting, we're not talking about the ag economy barometer specifically today, but what makes this really interesting is we're not seeing that in terms of optimism in the ag economy barometer. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, even though this is what it looks like, this is what it looks like uh, uh, as a point estimate. There's a lot of uncertainty out there, 
And, and so and so that's why we've been talking about thinking about marketing some of that 22 crop because there's a lot of factors out there uh, that could change that bar. Yeah, I, I would argue that looking at this chart would encourage you yes. to make some sales, right? Yes. And I recognize, and you and I both recognize, the potential for higher prices based on, you know, you can come up with yeah. several different scenarios that would lead both corn and soybean prices higher. But when you think about managing risk, and of course risk management is all about the idea that you can't forecast the future with a high degree of accuracy. If you have an opportunity to learn to lock in these kind of positive returns and you haven't done so, uh, you need to be making some sales. Yes. And that's not a price forecast, that's more of a risk management yes. forecast, right? Yeah, okay. definitely. All right. Well, here's your argument for why some people should be thinking about switching some acres that were intended for soybeans to corn. Yeah, th and this has also changed uh, since January. This was about uh, break even. Uh, there really was no difference between corn and soybeans in January. And as corn prices have increased more than, than soybeans since, since, uh, since January, particularly Feb February, March, and April, uh, recently, uh, we've seen an increase in, in the relative profitability of corn up to the tune of about $125. Uh, and and uh, as I've said many times on the webinar, if it looks like this in Indiana, they take that 125 in Indiana and, and, and increase that amount by at least 25 to $50 for Iowa because corn would look even more attractive in Iowa. And, and, so, uh, and, and so I was really surprised uh, when, in the planning intentions for Iowa and Illinois, uh, quite frankly. I thought there would be more continuous corn. So what do you think the driver there was? I think there's a lot of different things. I think the fact that the, the, that the cost of putting a corn crop in the ground is $1,100 is, is part of it. Uh, the very high fertilizer cost, the uncertainty related to getting inputs for corn uh, certainly contributed. So there's a lot of factors, I think, behind that. I'm not saying it wasn't logical because this is a very unusual year. Uh, and there was a lot of factors, I think, that, uh, that, that, cr that caused the situation uh, where they decided to plant more soybeans. Yeah, I mean, we were both surprised by the acreage numbers, and I, as was the trade, so uh, probably no point in, in elaborating on that. Yeah, I don't think we need to elaborate on this either. I mean, I just, it just shows again that, uh, how, how good corn really looks. Uh, if you look at that 1450 soybean price, which is a little bit lower than what we were talking about earlier, but it's similar uh, to what we were talking about earlier from a cash price uh, for, for this fall for soybeans. Uh, you know, obviously with, with $7 corn under every one of these uh, uh, soil types, uh, our, our productivity levels, uh, corn would be quite attractive. Now this is compared to second year soybeans. Uh, if I showed this for continuous corn, we, it, would still not, would, would, it still wouldn't indicate in Indiana that we're going to see a lot of continuous corn in Indiana. Uh, but we got to remember uh, in the planning tensions report, we were looking at 5.1 million acres of corn and 5.9 million acres of soybeans in Indiana. I just can't help but believe that's not going to switch a little bit. Maybe get to 5.2 or 5.3 million acres of corn, just a slight bump up, uh, you know, given where corn prices have done recently. And, and that could be a little bit yeah. weather dependent, right? Yes, if we, if we see conditions improve, weather dry up a little bit, have people some, give them opportunity to get uh, some significant corn acres here planted in April, uh, maybe the first week of May, we might see some switching, but um, it's, I think it's going to be tougher than you might think looking at the profitability estimates to get people to switch this year because of the input supply yeah. situation. That's really, I think, a concern. I think the fact that you pointed out that we've seen anhydrous prices rise might be indi indicative of some people maybe trying to make a little bit of a switch, do you think? Yes, we saw a $100 increase in, in, uh, in anhydrous prices in the last week or two. Uh, from what they were uh, pre <laughs> uh, pre uh, intentions yeah, and report. Prior, and prior to that, they were just kind of yeah. hanging. And they were ha hanging right around 15. Now they're over 16. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at the Illinois, Illinois production report. All right. So that wraps up our webinar for today. Um, our next Crop Outlook webinar will be on Monday, May 16th. Uh, USDA comes out uh, with their updated WASDE estimates the tail end of the prior week. So we'll do the webinar on Monday. And the details will be available on our website, purdue.edu slash commercial ag. And of course, if you don't have time to catch the webinar, uh, either live uh, or on the video later, uh, an alternative is to catch it on the Purdue Commercial Agcast podcast, which is also available from our website. And of course, you can subscribe to that on any of the major podcast providers. 
So with that, and I'm going to thank my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, for joining us today, and Dr. Nathan Thompson for providing some great input into our webinar today. Um, on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Minter. Thanks for joining us.